Welcome to episode 13 in our series on Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato's The Path of the Just. And we're, at, we're still in chapter 11. Uh, we're dealing with the specifics or examples about the virtue of cleanliness. And we've dealt with theft and promiscuity. And uh, we're now moving on to um, uh, the sphere of forbidden foods. And perhaps if we can in this episode, we're going to discuss uh, not shaming other people verbally. Um, so as we know, um, you are what you eat. And uh, I don't think people really understand. Uh, uh, you really do uh, become uh, the cleaner the food you eat, the kind of the more cleansed you are yourself. And apparently, according to Ramchal, that's exactly the same spiritually. If you eat something that's forbidden or non-kosher, you're actually defiling your neshama in some way. It's not just you're consuming foods and then it goes, it leaves your system. Uh, it has an effect on your soul. So we must heed these, uh, the following words of the Ramchal. And let's hear what the Ramchal has to say. So he begins regarding cleanliness in the sphere of forbidden foods. The third sin that relates to desire in order of priority after theft and promiscuity is that of prohibited foods. These include things that are ritually unclean or an admixture of this kind, combinations of meat and milk, prohibited animal fats, blood, food cooked by non-Jews or with the utensils of non-Jews and the wine that they use for libations and their wine in general. Cleansing oneself in all of these areas requires great meticulousness and firmness in order to deal with the instructive lust for good food and the monetary losses incurred as a result of the prohibitions of admixtures and the like. Additionally, their web of details is complex, as reflected in their numerous laws, which are widely known and clearly defined in the works of the halachic authorities. So the Ramchal is now going to talk about what I just mentioned uh, earlier, about the defilement of the heart through forbidden foods. So the Ramchal continues, furthermore, one who is lenient where they have directed him to be stringent is only destroying his own soul. As it says in Sifra on Shemini, chapter 12, verse 3, and do not make yourself impure with them, for then you will be further defiled through them. That's from Vayikra 11.43. Means that if you defile yourselves through them by transgressing them, you will ultimately be defiled by them. This is telling us that prohibited foods literally infuse the heart and soul of an individual with defilement to such an extent that the sanctity of the Shekhinah departs and distances itself from him. This is also what they said in the Talmud, and he quotes from Yoma 39. You will be further defiled by them. It means that you should not read this as you will be defiled, uh, or, but rather as you will become stupefied. The sin stupefies the heart of man, for this true wisdom and the faculty of intelligence that the Holy One, blessed be he, imparts to the pious will depart from him, as it states in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, for the eternal imparts wisdom. Such a person remains bestial and corporeal, immersed in the coarseness of this world. In this regard, prohibited foods involve a more serious consequence than all other prohibitions, since they are actually absorbed by a person's body, becoming a part of his flesh. So this is a very, very important fact that uh, Ramchal has brought to our attention. F speaking from a very personal point, uh, I personally have taken on uh, not eating meat anymore and I've become a vegetarian and I have to sincerely say that I feel as if uh, I have become kind of spiritually 
kind of a little bit cleansed in su- in some ways, and it's definitely something I've noticed. I'm not trying to tell anybody on who's listening to turn vegetarian, although I think in today's world it's actually an effective thing to do if you uh, if there is an issue with climate. Uh, being vegetarian definitely is the only solution that we have uh, as individuals to do something about um, climate change. But this is not a lesson about um, how to behave during this uh, uh, crisis. It's more to do with diet. I feel as if um, uh, avoiding meat uh, has has done has given me benefits in terms of, like the Ramchal says here, the the the. the the food that you eat infuses into your heart and soul. And I think also animals that suffer before they die, which is the vast majority of industrial, uh, you know, industrial uh, meat plants, uh, they, um, the animals suffer before they die. And that suffering stays in them. I'm not talking about shechita. I'm talking about pre-shechita, the actual, the, this, the, before they go for shechita. Uh, they're under tremendous amounts of stress, and that you're eating that that, that bad energy, you're consuming it, and you're making a part of yourself. And I know that the uh, Rav Cook was a a big uh, believer in vegetarianism, and that it's it's a choice of the of a of the kind of the generation that will receive the Mashiach will be vegetarian. He says he was vegetarian during the week, but on Shabbos. He had meat, and that is a great balance because you're doing most of the job. Uh, but I think the idea that what you put inside you, you are what you eat, is absolutely true. You, you find your madrega will be raised uh, when you avoid eating things that are not perhaps the right things to eat. Uh, if ever, anybody wants to try it, I urge them to try it, even if it's temporarily or if it's just during the week. You find a, a big difference. Um, so that's that from a personal point of view. That definitely, I found that reinforced by what the Ramchal says: you are what you eat. And uh, if you eat non-kosher food uh, or impure food, you find you will have that will have a direct effect on your soul. But the fact is. You don't notice it uh, if you're doing it um, okay. You know, if you're doing it the whole time, not unknowingly, you don't notice the effects. So, the Ramchal continues, uh, and now he describes the need for great care in the idea of shechita. Uh, we, you know, we must realize that the, the laws of shechita were specifically made to be overly complex. Uh, to make you perhaps sit back and think, are you doing the right thing, and to take great care. Uh, if you can avoid any mishap, because sometimes it's not about you keeping kosher, it's about the, 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 the guy who's, uh, the, the shochet, is he doing everything correctly? Uh, so this is very important. Um, so l- let's continue, the Ramchal continues. In order to teach us that not only unclean animals all repugnant creatures are impure, but that impurity also affects animals that are categorized as kosher, yet are themselves ritually unclean, as scripture states in Vayikra 11.47, in order for you to distinguish between what is impure and pure. The sages of blessed memory have commented in Sifra Shemini 12.7, it is unnecessary to distinguish between a donkey and a cow, so why does it say between, between what is impure and pure? It is teaching us to distinguish between what is ritually unclean to you and what is ritually clean to you, and to distinguish between the cutting of the greater part of the trachea and the cutting of only half of it. What is the difference between the greater part and only half? Only a hair's breadth. The reason why they concluded with that, conquest, that question what is the difference between the greater part and so and so, is the, to inform us of how great the power of a mitzvah is, for literally only a hair's breadth separates the impure from the pure. And now the Ramchal is going to uh, remind us to treat forbidden foods, or treif foods, as if they were poison for us. So the Ramchal continues, Therefore, anyone with a little bit of sense will consider prohibited foods as poison, 
or is a food that has poison mixed into it. If this were the case, and a person had any suspicion, even if only a slight one, would he allow himself to eat from this? Of course not. And if he did, he would be considered a complete fool. Similarly, prohibited foods, as we have explained, are truly poisonous to the heart and soul. Who then, possessing any intelligence, would be lax with himself when a suspicion of something forbidden is involved? Referring to this, it has been said, and he quotes from Proverbs 23, verse 2, and place a knife to your gullet if you possess intelligence. We will now discuss sins that derive from a social milieu where people meet and congregate. These include verbal abuse, causing severe embarrassments to another, giving misleading advice, tale-bearing, hatred and vengeance, taking oaths, lying and desecrating the Eternal's name. Is there anyone who can say, I am cleansed of them, I am purified of any blame for them? The facets of these prohibitions are so numerous and contain such subtle distinctions that it is a challenge to adhere to them faithfully. So this is an extremely important uh, item in this list of specifics about the virtue of cleanliness. And now the Ramchal is moving on to uh, our, our talk and our chatter and our uh, tale-bearing and much worse, I mean not much worse, but of various uh, um, things along those lines. We know that sometimes if you verbally abuse someone or you embarrass them, it can have, it can have effects that last for decades. Some people have been embarrassed in situations and have never been able to return to those people. Uh, that's that social setting uh, and it remains with them lingering in their minds for as long as they live sometimes. We must understand the power. Uh, my dad used to always say, D did I know what the most powerful muscle in the body is? And I would think the thigh or the arm or the shoulder. And he said, no, the most powerful muscle in the body is the tongue, which is very, very true. We have we can me uh, wield immense power with the words we talk for good or for evil and unfortunately sometimes our chatter tends to uh, take us more to the latter side of those two com of those two variations so let's let's begin the ramchal continues with starts with uh, verbal abuse verbal abuse in general means that is forbidden to speak in the presence of another in a manner that will embarrass him this prohibition applies with even greater force if you say something directly to embarrass him or act in a manner that will cause him embarrassment. And regarding this, our sages have said in Baba Matsya 58b, if he is a Baal to Shuva, do not say, remember your prior deeds. If he is beset by sickness, do not say to him as Job's friend said to him in, and he quotes from Eov 4.7, do you recall any man being guiltless and being destroyed? So if someone is suffering, uh, don't say publicly or to him directly, him and her directly, you know, you, you're, you're, you're suffering, but you know, God doesn't make innocent people suffer. Uh, that's a nasty thing to say. Uh, and he continues, if, a donkey, if donkey drivers ask him for grain, he shouldn't say, Go to so-and-so who sells grain, when he knows that he never sold grain in his life. They have already stated in Job, verbal abuse is worse than even monetary abuse, deceit, for regarding the former, it states in Vayikra 25.17, and you shall be afraid of your God. Whereas regarding the latter, the latter being the monetary abuse, um, it does not say, and you shall be afraid of your God. And of course, this sin is compounded when it is done publicly. For we have explicitly been taught in Ethics of Our Fathers, chapter 3, verse uh, Mishnah 3, 11, He who publicly embarrasses another has no shame in the worlds to come. And also, quoting from Baba Matsya 59a, Rav Chista said, All the gates of prayer have been sealed with the exception of the gates of abuse. Rashi said, for one who has been verbally abused and cries out, the gates of prayer are not, not sealed. 
Furthermore, Rabbi El Azar says, for every sin the Holy One, blessed be He, exacts retribution for through a messenger, with the exception of verbal abuse. And they said, uh, also, there are three sins for which the curtain is not sealed, and one of them is verbal abuse. So, uh, now the Ramchal discusses how much, how we should take care not to uh, shame someone, even if we're genuinely trying to rebuke him. Sometimes we must avoid embarrassing someone in public. Perhaps we feel that we are uh, compelled to correct somebody, but you have to look at the situation that you're in at that moment. Are you with other people? Will you embarrass the person? Are you going to do more harm than good? Uh, this is what the Ramchal is going to discuss now. So he continues, verbal abuse is objectionable even when it relates to a mitzvah. As scripture states, and he quotes from Vayikra 19 verse 17, continually reprove your fellow man. And our sages of blessed memory commented in Arachin 16b, even if his face changes color. Therefore it states, and he quotes from Vayikra 19.17, But do not bring a sin upon yourself when reproving him. From all of the above, you can see how far-reaching this prohibition is and how harsh is its punishment. So we are reminded, I remember learning in uh, Mishnah Torah, uh, Rambam's Mishnah Torah, possibly Hilchot Tshuva or Hilchot Deot, how you mustn't make, make a person's face change color, whether it be red with shame or turn white in uh, fear or, or, sh or to be shocked that your face loses its color. Any change in color of a person's countenance is a grave, grave, grave sin. And don't be the one to cause that. Even if you think you're doing right by correcting them, be very diplomatic and use a lot of integrity when reproving somebody because you could have the far worse effect than you ever realized, not only with the person that you're reproving, but with your God. Because if you embarrass someone in public, which sometimes can happen, you know, it stays with that person for a long, long, long time. So I think we're going to pause it there for this episode. We've still got a, quite a, a lot of... Uh, subjects to cover in this uh, chapter 11 uh, of the specifics about the virtue of cleanliness and in the next episode something a little bit more light-hearted uh, or rather a little bit more positive we're going to discuss applying the virtue of cleanliness when giving advice good advice